podcast on the internet i checked we are this is the metal hammer of doom podcast i am your host for tonight uh full on one one fania contributor because if i say writer that'd be a lie because i haven't written for the site for two months because i'm lazy i'm full on one mania contributor bearded wonder and guy who know who now understands how the working man feels i am mr robert cooper and welcome to you know another great edition of this podcast uh, I didn't, you know, I was bet you're wondering where I was last week, or last two weeks, two weeks ago, sorry. Two weeks ago, I was totally about to do a new Agalock album, and then Blog Duck Radio decided to uh, tell me to go die in a well. So I told it, go away, I'll mess with you in two weeks. So there was no podcast, but you know what, Mark's coming back in two weeks, so that'll just make up for it. It's going to be amazing and great, and I'm going to love Mark hosting again, because man, hosting podcasts is rough. Ugh. Ugh, I don't know how some people do it. You know, some people, including uh, my co-host for tonight, uh, like the the master of all things evil, host of Everyone Loves a Bad Guy, as well as the host slash moderator of the Four One Ground and Pound Radio Show. Here he is, folks, Mr. Robert Winfrey. How do you do? <laughs> I do good because now I'm not hosting. I just get to contribute. It's so nice. This is a rare treat for me nowadays. I mean, I'm hosting mine. I'm hosting the Ground and Pound show. I'm uh, actually next Tuesday. I'll get an early plug in. I get to wrap up my stint hosting the Long Road to Ruin. I got three shows I'm running over at the moment. I'm I'm happy to just sit here and and be a contributor to have to run this stuff. God, yes, yeah. I never had a problem hosting until. Uh... But yeah, I got a job about four weeks ago, and now I have to like try and you know get home on time, and get everything set up, and it's become you know a lot more constrained. I mean, shit, I was, I mean, I'm still technically on four podcasts. Like, I haven't been on the cheap seats in like a month and a half, but that's because scheduling keeps getting in the way. Ugh. And my Sentai Rider podcast is on hold because my computer's dead. So when I get that fixed, you'll totally hear me get the blabbing, blabbing, blabbing stuff. But yeah, I, t- I totally know how you feel now. But I'm happy because Mark's going to be back in two weeks, and we're going to be talking like Steel Panther. That's you know, a little early plug. But, you know, enough about the future. You know, we'll get to the future when we get there. Cause that's how the future works. Ha uh-huh. ha. Uh, this week we're covering the uh, the album from one of my favorite power metal bands, actually. Uh, they kind of they kind of snuck in there under the radar for me a few years ago. It was actually in uh, 2012. Yeah. You know, they kind of snuck in the radar. It's, it's Sabaton and their new album, Heroes, which that album cover is kind of odd the more the, the more I look at it. Is it a, like, Viet, is it like the Vietnam-era U.S. soldier punching a, is that a Nazi? Is that, is that a Nazi a German soldier? I believe that one is supposed to be a German soldier. The other one, uh, it's it's period appropriate for World War II. Uh, especially given the weapon he's holding, well, the weapon's a little outdated. That looks, I was thinking he's from World War One, punching a guy from World War Two. Because the reason I was thinking Vietnam was, I guess, the rolled up sleeves, and there's a helicopter in the background. And I know helicopters are all about Vietnam. Yeah, well, there's also a flying fortress up there near the top, so you got all kinds oh, of stuff shit. going on. Yeah, yeah, I think this is just one of those album covers where it's just like, you know, every, all like heroes from different eras are all together. But yeah, yeah, we're talking uh, new Sabaton album, Heroes, tonight. I'm pretty excited. Spoiler, good album. But uh, yeah, just to get started on Sabaton, you know, as we usually do on this show, uh, I know I'm the one that chose the album, but uh, I know in the past you've said you're really not a big metalhead, but Sabaton's one of the bands you actually like. Uh, you know, what attracts you to them? 
Well, I may have lied when I told you I wasn't a huge metalhead. I think I just draw a different uh, line of delineation than a lot of people do. My my love for metal extends about as far as you, uh, when you get to guys whose lyrics you can't understand and who start doing the, you know, the really deep, distorted voice. That's where I kind of check out. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of where it. my interest level checks out. But uh, no, I actually works. discovered Sabaton by accident, courtesy of Pandora. Uh, for anyone who doesn't, oh, yes. anyone who doesn't use it, I put it. I uh, had just found. Uh, I just discovered Lordy actually. Which They're interesting. I still, I get a kick out. I still enjoy their music. So I, you know, set up a Pandora station, put a bunch of stuff, and that was one of them. And because I liked that and some of the other things, you know how their funny, their you know funky little algorithm works, they said, here you might like this, and it, you know. Primo Victoria, Into the Fire, and you know some of the stuff from the early, you know, I think their second, technically their second album. And I'm like, yes, this is like, you know, this stuff, it, it falls right in line with what I like, that stuff, Ailstorm, Manowar. So I found it by accident, but I, darn if it wasn't right up my alley. Well, I mean, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, Pandora, I stopped using them when one of my best, best friends started hating them because he'd keep downvoting... Uh, like disturbed and disturbed would keep showing up. <laughs> like there's once he downvoted it, you know, gave it the thumbs down so it wouldn't show up again and it showed up right right after that. It's like <laughs> he's like fuck this, I'm going to iHeartRadio. And iHeartRadio is actually really good. I really enjoy them. Like the only thing I miss with uh Pandora is on Pandora I have like twelve stations and I mix them all together. So I get, yeah, I get a little I, yeah, well, I got the one station I just put in enough artists and songs that I like from different genres that I think it now covers everything. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good way to cover it. Yeah, uh, actually, you said I've done funny thing with them. Uh, like, you know, I'm still hoping to bring back my metal column. I'm just lazy. Now I have a job, so, like, the hours that I usually operate to write and podcast are about 8 to 11 p.m. I work from 6 to 10. <laughs> <laughs> so like my, my my chief operating hours in terms of internet uh, personality of sorts are kind of being uh, cramps. But uh, the past two years I've uh, wrote a top fifty list, which I think that's the main reason why I kind of got burnt out this year because that top fifty list is a lot of work, especially for me. And you have to like put everything you think down. <laughs> I uh, in, yeah. in twenty yeah, which is actually sad because the uh, two spreadsheets I had for that 2012 and the 2013 list are actually uh, trapped on that computer that's uh, screwed up. Just so sad. But luckily, I keep my Spotify in order the same order as my spreadsheet in terms of like you know where I rank it. So I'm good. But anyways, uh, yeah, in 2012, I uh, I compiled a top 50 list out of I think it was like the top 50 out of maybe the 100 albums I listened to that year. And usually there will be one or two albums that I uh, I kind of sneak in there. I leave room for them on the list, like you know, because I'm like, okay, there's no way that this album's not going to get there. And the last album I listened to in 2012, I was like, huh, Sabaton. You know, I've heard that name before. You know, maybe they'll be pretty good. And I listened to them, and I was really I was really excited to hear them, and I I enjoyed it. Album was really uh, fun and cheesy. Actually, the thing that uh first that I first heard them from was a. Uh, when I was doing research for my column once, they uh, Sabaton released a sweet like a Swedish Empire uh, flash game. It's like uh, things like England and Sweden and Russia, and I want to say it's like Greece or I don't know the fourth uh, party is, but it's you're trying to take over all the territories of the uh, of the game board, and the way you do it is you uh, challenge your the enemy and it rolls a six sided die, and I uh, played that for a few hours, and the song for it was. Uh, the, Carol, the instrumental for Carolus Rex. And it got in my head. And then, you know, I'm listening to the album. I'm like, wow, okay, I remember this song. I like this album. So, you know, that made it into my uh, top 50. I think it was like in the 20s, you know, mid-20s. And then uh, what, what, re- what really put me over the edge was uh, I was looking through eBay one day because I had a little extra cash thing for like Christmas or something. So I'm like, oh, awesome. Oh, this Sabaton album is really cheap because Sabaton is not a, is a band where their albums are not cheap because I guess because they're from Sweden? I don't know. But they're hard to get to sometimes. So I managed to get that real cheap and I blasted it through in my car for like two weeks and I was in love. And I'm still in love with the band. Like, they are, they're cheesy. And at, there's some points where I, I, when I listen to them, I'm like, this is kind of poppy in a way. But you know what? I like it. Like, you know, it gets me 
gets me kind of happy and skippy, and their songs are kind of really epic, and they talk about war heroes just like they do here. It's really, it's a really cool band and stuff. I I dig them. But yeah, uh, you know, from Careless Rex, which was I think their best album, at least as far as I've listened to, that was really good. Did you, did you ever listen to it? I haven't listened to the whole thing yet. No. Oh, but I need. So I've heard good things, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wind up uh, finding it like tomorrow or something while I'm. Yanking carpet out of the downstairs. Oh boy, that sounds like a ball. <laughs> yeah, it's it wouldn't be if it was a euphemism. Sadly, it's not a euphemism. It's just carpet <laughs> has to come up. <laughs> Yanking the carpet. And <laughs> uh, well, no, the, it's a really good. It's a great concept album. I think it's the only concept album they did or they've done so far. And apparently, it is incredibly historically accurate because they. Uh, they check the facts of their lyrics with a world now uh you know, uh world now historian on Swedish history. Famous world now historian. Because, you know, usually when you're world renowned you're famous. <laughs> but it was yeah, uh, it's a really good album and you know, put a lot of expectations for this one. And when I found out this album was a concept album, I was at first kind of a uh, little down. So I was like, Oh damn, you know, I was really looking forward to another concept album from Sabaton. But you know, after hearing the uh after hearing the uh, album, I'm not sad. It's just so it's really good. Though I must say, the first thing I thought of uh, when I saw the cover was America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got a little uh, bit of that feel to it. And it's funny because they're Swedish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess it's because it just represents the Allies or something. But I was like, I was like, oh, this is so fucking American. And then I'm like, oh, these guys are Swedish, huh? Okay, that's interesting. But yeah, it's a, it's definitely an interesting album cover. Actually, I like the alternate album a little bit, album cover a little better. The one where it's just got their logo and it's got the flags. I thought it was uh, I like that one a little better. I guess because it just looks more like a. Uh, a little more, what's the word, word? Maybe dignified. That's the word. Cause, I mean, this right here is like America, which is cool. Like I've come to love this album cover. But uh, the first thing I thought of was like, it looks a little douchey and America. But I like it. But anyways, enough of my damn rambling. God, you can tell I haven't done any podcasts in like the past month because I'm talking and talking and talking and talking. You gotta get it off your anyway, chest. That's right, I do. Just like a girl, just like a shirt at a Girls Gone Wild taping, I gotta get it off my chest. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it's Heroes, I don't think there's really. This is actually a really interesting album now that I think of it, because I was just looking at the Wikipedia page. I'm like, oh shit, this is actually the uh, first album featuring almost the band. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. They, uh, well, they uh, had some falling outs. Uh, just due to scheduling and whatnot after the release of their last album. So this is the first time we get, you know, like, I think it's like four new guys. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say it's the uh, drummer, what is it, Hans Van Dahl, guitarist, Old England. It's T-H-O-B-B-E. Man, like I can do a lot of Asian dialects and stuff, but I cannot understand some of these more... Uh, <laughs> A little more Russian influence. Let's see, uh, Chris Rorland, the other guitarist, and I think uh, his poor Sunstorm. I think he was the uh, bassist. Yeah. Yep. Pretty much. Yeah. Those. It's actually three members are new right now because I think they uh, just got rid of the. Uh, uh, what you gonna call him? The keyboardist. They got rid of the keyboardist, and then uh, Joachim Broden, the vocalist, he just plays keyboards on the album, I think. Because he was their uh, keyboardist originally. I don't th- even think he was their original singer, Bo, if I recall correctly. I think maybe it was like a Phil Collins Genesis thing. Probably. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but yeah, pretty much most of the band uh, most of the band left to go join, and they went and formed Civil War. And we talked about that album last year. It was great. A little different, and then the drummer left uh, earlier this year because I guess he just had it up to here with the scheduling. Like, yeah, that was something that uh, I think really became an issue with them because they tour a lot. Like, they're, they've got a fall yeah. tour coming, and I'm really excited because it's them, Amon, and Martha Skeleton Witch. 
That is a weird toy line. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Skeleton Witch is awesome. And I love Amount of Morris, but, yeah, I don't think they'd be up your alley. But that, it's weird because you don't usually see power metal mixed with, like, death metal and then, like, a black and thrash. <laughs> yeah. You don't usually see that court lineup. But, I mean, hey, Sabaton did do a uh, they did do a Amount of Morris cover earlier, so, yeah. Hmm. But, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I guess. So, uh as it does, but yeah, they're coming. They're, they're coming to North Carolina. I'm excited because a lot of places people don't come to North Carolina because it's not exactly a metal mecca. <laughs> Thing I don't think they come to Utah very much. You got it bad. You think you got it bad? I'm lucky that for some reason Metallica has an affinity for the state. I don't know what it is. But people here in Utah are really – a lot of people here love Metallica, and they tend to make it a point to come here when they can. I mean, I remember they were on um, – what was it? I think it was OzFest, you know, like five or six years ago. Or they were doing their tour, and they were scheduled to come through Salt Lake, and nobody else wanted to come. So they called up um, some other band. I forget what it was who was just, like, in the area and said, hey, you know, we're going to Utah. You want to open for us? And Sure, but, I mean, the fact that they'll go out of their way to come here, you know, it's – I'm grateful. I mean, again, we don't get a whole lot of stuff that you know, is up my alley, so. Uh, yeah, I totally know how you feel. So I don't know exactly how you feel because, like, nobody comes to where you are. So, you know, around here, we like, we get some really good stuff in Charlotte, which is about an hour and a half with traffic. I just can't make it down there. But a lot of times we get a lot of those core bands, some of the more hardcore stuff. As you would see our usual illustrious hosts, Mark, Rad- Mark Radlitz, like some hate breed, you know, something he'd like. I'm just like, mm-hmm. nah, not my thing. Not my thing, bro. <laughs> but, yeah, I was thinking, I was like, man, I, I don't know I'm bitching. And I said, oh, wait, Robert lives in Utah. Never mind. That's not that's <laughs> even less, uh, even less of a metal mecca. <laughs> One could say that. Uh, yeah, I mean, hey, y'all are close to some hot, hot spots, right? <laughs> California. I want to drive. Right? I want to drive, you know, three and a half hours to Vegas, and then deal with Vegas. Everything costs uh-huh. more just because it's in Las Vegas. Of course, that's like going to a. Uh, I can go to a movie theater or a sports or a sports game. Everything's going to cost more because you're there. Not any special yeah, reason, I mean, I, it's just because you're there. Yeah, it's just because it's there. I looked at it, like, um, well, Motley Crue tends to come through. Uh, they came through here last time. At both their last tours, I think they stopped over in here. and. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I was like, okay, it costs me, you know, for, say it cost me 50 bucks to get a, and there's an outdoor amphitheater that they usually go to, so say it cost me 50 bucks to go sit on the green, go sit on the grass, bring a you know, I, bring a blanket or something, I chill out on the grass wherever I can get there and sit down. It costs me like 150 to go to Vegas to be indoors. I mean, it's it's, it's crazy. And I, then I have to drive there, and there's gas and Vegas traffic, which is, oh, God, it's awful. So, I don't know, call, I mean, Denver's the only other place I might make an effort, but I don't feel like driving that far. Again, it would take something special to get me to drive that far out of my way, to dedicate a whole day to it. It's awful. Yeah, like, Charlotte gets a decent amount of, like, smaller stuff, but I just can't make it out there because I actually don't own a car of my own. <laughs> Yay. Ring. Well, you know, hey, you got a job now, so that'll be on the that'll be in the future. Oh yeah. Then yeah, you can look I'm, then you can look forward to car payments and then replacing things that break. No, in my life that'd be everything. I'm paying gas. I don't have to pay gas yet. I told my mom she's I'm like, dude, I'll pay for the gas. She's like, No, as long as you're doing good in school, I'll pay for it for now. <laughs> so I was like, well, well, nowadays okay. that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> that is. That is. So as much as we bitch in twelve, it's cool. It is cool. But anyways, enough of my personal bullshit and bitching about how concerts never come my way. How about some sabotage? All right. So here is uh, track one off of Heroes. It is called Night Wishes. Night Wishes. Night Witches. And it is about the all-female Soviet 586 Night Bomber Regiment. I didn't even know that was a thing. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I figured that'd be. Some, I figured that's one thing that uh, kind of that you gravitate to because I know aren't aren't you like a big like kind of military history guy? I'm a, I'm aware started. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, don't know, just, I think there's something like. in the Y chromosome that generally leads us to be interested in conflict as a general rule. Uh, my dad was in the mili- My dad was in the Army Reserves for a long time, which is part of the reason I moved around so much as a kid. And I just, I kind of gravitated towards it. I, uh, I own a lot of stuff, especially about uh, the Civil War is kind of my, uh, you know, not oh, area yeah. of expertise. But that's what I was up on for a while. I still own like the three definitive uh, books chronicling the events of the Civil War, the American Civil War. That is for our overseas listeners. <laughs> yeah, the one that mattered. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying. Never mind that anybody. technically the American Revolutionary War was just a civil war until we won. That's right, because we're America. Wow, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, civil war. I did civil war enacting for like ten years. It's fun. It must yeah. have been fun. Oh, that was awesome. Well, the 145th Gettysburg was a treat. I didn't get to go to the 150th, but the 145th was really good. We had some uh, Europeans there. Watching the uh, Unibasitis drink with the Germans was a treat. <laughs> I that was funny. They, uh, it was so much fun. The, apparently, the 150th was kind of a mess because there was a bunch of like inter, you know, there's a bunch of politics involved. So they had two of them. One would assume. Yeah, I was like, eh. yeah, 145th. One for all the racists and one for the normal people. <laughs> I uh, wish you made a small one for their own people. No, I'm just kidding. Any, anybody who did Civil War reenacting with me, and, well, <laughs> I mean, no offense. Okay, I mean a little offense, but not much. <laughs> but, yeah, it was pretty cool. Oh, that's another thing y'all missed out, because you live in Utah. Civil War reenactments. Damn. Yeah. Y'all just get no fun. There's not a whole lot out here. <laughs> There's not a whole lot out here, so. Oh, man. That sucks. Because, yeah, I get to, I don't go to them anymore, but yeah, I used to. But, anyways, Night Witches. This song's pretty awesome. Yeah. About the opening track, there, Robert. What you dig it? What do you think? I do. Uh, again, my predilections run a bit more towards speed metal as a general rule. So I like things a little bit faster. I like, you know, some of the, uh, yeah, my music, my knowledge of music terminology is pretty awful. So I might embarrass myself just a little bit here. But uh, you know, some of the the harder metallic beats that they have in the background. The speed at which it's all conducted, I, I really did. I I dug this one. This is a it's a good way to kind of grab your attention at the start of an album, and you know you you know it's a you know the joke from you know uh, whether you're in professional wrestling, uh, fighting, or whatever it is, you need something you know you need the hot opener. You need something that 
will go out there, get people's attention, and you know, it's up to everything else to follow it. But this was, I felt this was a good choice to kind of start off as, start off the album as, you know, this is it, pay attention to what's coming next. So I did, I really did dig it. Huh, very cool. Yeah, speed metal is one of those things. Like, I like speed metal, but I guess it's because uh, I tend to lead more towards thrash when it comes to heavy, faster stuff. So usually speed metal, I'm like, eh, it's just fast heavy metal. So I once had an argument with a friend of mine who thought there was no such thing as black metal. He's like, no, it's death metal. He's like, speed metal's the fourth like big subgenre. I'm like, gosh, speed metal's just fast heavy metal. No, shut up, Coop. I mean, I like speed metal. <laughs> And I like the way I don't think uh, you're wrong. No, no, I mean, I was, I was like, speed metal is not that big. Like, when I think of speed metal, I tend to think of Motorhead and Blind Guardian. <laughs> yeah, Blind Guardian's early stuff was pure speed metal. It was awesome. So awesome. A little power metal level. But yeah, like, this song here is, I, I love the way it starts, because, you know, nothing really gets me going for an album, or at least, you know, for an album like this, and, you know, fast and a little heavy, and, you know, it's kind of epic, because my, my music terminology is even worse than yours. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, yeah, epic. Because uh, I actually bought another album of theirs. Uh, oh, what was it? Uh, I say it was an Otero Dominatos, maybe. Something like that. It was, it was their second album. And it was good, but some of the songs I felt they were kind of lacking because they weren't exactly like this. Like, there was no real punch to it. Like, yeah. that's because this song here, like, it, it kind of gets you, uh, gets in your head and it, it kind of carries with you for the rest of the day. That's kind of what I, that's what I really like about this band is they are, uh, I want to say they're almost one of those that are very vocally dependent. Like, you know, like some some album bands are really all about the music. I feel like this band's a lot more about, like, the lyrics and the singing. And then with, you know, some catchy hooks to the side. Not saying that the, uh, you know, like the the guys playing the instruments are, like, you know, like Paramore or something. Ugh. <laughs> I felt bad for those dudes. <laughs> yeah, your Haley Williams is a backup band, just letting you know. I'm pretty sure it's what the oldest guys left. But yeah, you know, it's, well, I, I don't mean to. Look I agree at it like, with you, and I think part of that is because they what they try to do, and not every band does this, and not only not every genre does this, but I feel that Sabaton tries to make a point of telling stories with their songs, and that makes them a bit more vocally dependent. If you're in the genre of, you know, any if, if you're in if you're in a genre of music that has vocals, storytelling is dependent on the vocalization, the lyric writing, all that fun stuff. I mean, if you're like. You know, old school classical, you can get away with storytelling without it, but you know, from a contemporary standpoint, it's a lot more difficult. Yeah, there's very few uh, instances, especially in metal. Like some of the uh, like death metal bands, like they they tend to they can get away with a little bit of it because a lot of like you know them tell more horror stories, and they can milk a lot out of atmosphere. Because I feel like that's another thing that uh, Sabaton does a real good job of is kind of like framing framing the story they want to tell with the uh, the song the you know the way they play their songs you know like this yeah. one's fast and kind of and kind of really kind of has a nice like swing to it and it's about battle and night witches and bombers well, you know well it's also tanks. about you know night bombing so by definition it's going to be fast it's going to be a bit unexpected uh, you know they, you're right they do a great job framing the story with how they you know, with the style of their music, be it uh, the tempo, the instrument choices, the whole nine yards. You, know, you, you get the full kind of immersive experience for, you know, the three and a half minutes of the song or however long it happens to be. Yeah, and they just they do a, just a great job of doing that, which I feel like they just don't get as much credit for as they should sometimes. But like, one of my best friend, like the three members, the three other guys in this band, like all three of them, like, yeah, the is not that good. All they do is just sing about tanks. <laughs> I like the joke with Sabaton. It's all about tanks. Well, sometimes. Oh, yeah, like Ghost Division. That's one of their best songs. It's about tanks. Yeah. And Panzers and Rommel. And, yeah. Pretty great. But yeah, enough, enough of Night Witches. I thought it was a really good song. Great. Just a great opener. 
I feel like if this was the opener on almost every album, I'd be fine with that. Every album of theirs, not yeah. every album. I don't want my Candlemas album eh. opening with this. Every album. Put this on the next George Strait album. <laughs> yes, next uh, Florida Georgia Line album. Do it. Oh, God. <laughs> I referenced them. I feel dirty. So speaking of, I was listening to uh, one of the uh, those internet guys, Todd in the Shadows. He did this one Jason Derulo song, and it was so bad. God. I was wondering where I'd heard it from before, too, because I was at a friend's birthday party, and this one girl got, like, just, like, drunk as shit and started, not oh, there's the power. Oh, there it comes back on. Started just, like, shaking her ass and everything in front of everybody and just kept singing, whistling this song. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? Where have I heard this? And I was like, oh, it was her. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, God. So bad. Anyways, yes. I, on to. I uh, imagine the more alcohol you ingest, the worse your ta- the worse your taste in music gets. Uh, luckily, I don't drink, so my taste in music is gonna remain. I'm with you. Oh yeah, but yeah, she was. Uh, she's like shaking that butt. Da, 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 da. And after listening to the song like once, I was like, ew, this is <laughs> horrible. I've taken like my band. I've had bands that take craps better than this. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. So, next song, No Bullets Fly. Uh, it's about the Charlie Brown and Franz Stiegler, Stiegler incident, in which a German pilot named Franz Stiegler, Stiegler am, accompanied a disabled American bomber back to his base. Huh. Yeah, it's one thing. of the craziest stories. I mean, you get these crazy stories that come out of World War II, and part of it is because for so long in popular culture, we demonized every one of the Germans, all the German soldiers, the, you know, we, and we failed to, as a culture, I think, understand that there were good people, you know, be it fighting the war or just backing you know, there were, you know, don't get me wrong, there were some evil people as well, but there were some good people there, and every now and then you get stories like this one, and you know, he disabled the bomber, stopped it from reaching its target, but uh, he wasn't going to you know, shoot a disabled plane out of the sky. He safely escorted it back to its home base. I mean, it, it's one of those crazy stories that you hear every now and then. Yeah, yeah, I had not heard about it. But then again, yeah, as a uh, – oftentimes as a kind of a culture we do that, we kind of just demonize the, uh, the enemies. It's easier, to, it's easier to paint in broad strokes, I guess. Well, yeah, because, you know, it's better if you just don't really show the humanity of the other side, because then you might feel bad. <laughs> it's better if you feel like you're killing monsters. That's right. Yeah. That's how it works. Uh, but, yeah, see, I didn't know that. But that's really cool. And, see, that's how you learn things from metal kids. Listen to Sabaton <laughs> and Iron Maiden all day. There you go. History class. Bam. Anyways, so here is our track two, No Bullets Fly. Bombers down the stairs, free. They wounded men scared to the bone. 
I did there. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But yeah, was I the only one that was thinking when I heard that intro of uh, uh, Bad Omen by Megadeth? Not now that you mention it, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I first heard it, I was like, oh, Bad Omen. Huh. Okay. No, there's, there's some songs? similarities there. Yeah, they changed it uh, in the second part because if it went dun 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 no, that would be bad. Uh, that's still one of my favorite. If I ever need to laugh, I go watch that. Him trying to explain how it's different. <laughs> He's like, see, see, it's like, don't, don't see, see, it's different. I was like, oh, ha ha. Uh. Oh, you pretty much ripped it off. <laughs> yeah, you, you did. It was a good beat. It was a good beat. You know what? You, you tried. It was a good beat, but no. <laughs> you could, you uh, could copy worse than Queen. Yeah, that's true. I'm sure. Like, I'm not a huge Queen fan. Like, I, I'm one of those people that like thinks they're awesome. I just never listen to them much. But I'm sure they had a few shitty songs. Everyone does. Yeah, I mean, sure, I'm sure everybody does. Like, that's it's just one of those things of music. Like, you are not going to hit the bullseye every time. Boy. But yeah, what do you what do you think of this song? Yeah, this is one of those songs, um, for me, I think the interesting aspect of this comes in once you know the story behind it more than the song itself. I mean, you know, once you understand you know, the story that they're telling, you get a little bit of the backstory about the events that inspired it, it makes a lot more sense. Um, I'm trying to think about it. Uh, but the way that they... Uh, the pacing for the tempo, the way it up, moves up and down, is not, is good for it. I, the way they slow down and some of the more kind of grandiose and inspiring uh, tonal you know, spacing selections. Actually, it's not actually the notes themselves; it's spacing them out properly that ins- that creates the ne- the uh, emotional reaction more so than the notes themselves, uh, like the Superman chorus. Not Man of Steel, but like the original Superman chorus. You can play those same those same spacing just about any set of notes, and you still have essentially the desired effect, emotional response. So I really, but I you know once I knew more what was going on within the story, what they were trying to tell, I started liking it a little bit more. So uh, you know, again, a thumbs up. I enjoyed it. Jesus, sorry, outside. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if anybody can hear it, but it is pouring buckets. But uh, I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, this is one of the songs like, I liked it. Like I totally listened to it again. Like I'd probably listen to most of this album all the way through just because it's one of those that's just so catchy and so well done. It's just a generally good song. But you know, I, I think it doesn't have as big of a punch if you don't know what it's about. Like when I was listening to this album, I didn't know what most of the songs were about just because I didn't really do much research because I'm a bum. <laughs> But you know, now that I know, it's really it's really kind of cool. And I guess it's uh, the way I look at it is the guy who wanted to teach history once. It's just a really cool way to you know learn things. Like I wish every subject in school had a metal soundtrack. <laughs> Need a metal soundtrack in a comic book uh, like textbook, and I would be I would be like valedictorian. There we go. We need graphic novel adaptations and metal and and metal music. That's all we need, lectures. folks. There we go. Uh, maybe that's that's what I'm gonna do. That's actually what Jason Teasley tried to do with his EMT training, his EMT training manuals. He's gonna he was hey, trying to uh, yeah he was actually trying to get like comic book uh, like material for uh, learning. So he's like, man, it was learn. I'd be so much easier. I don't know. I don't think it ever got off the ground. But I was like, that's that's a good 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 try. You know, I wish I could do that. I, I went through that. like my entire high school career because I could associate answers and subjects with you know like within history I could associate uh, various historical leaders or actions I could through like three steps tie them to a Simpsons quote. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> so in my head, I see, I you know, I hear a Simpsons line or you know, something like that, and then I trace that back to the point I want to get to. And it, you know, whatever memory device works for you, I say more power to you. Who was uh, who was I was saying Boo Ernst? Hans Moleman. Okay, well, I was wondering who in uh, so was that who in history it was? I don't know, but no, that, it's the character Hans Moleman, which is nowadays actually yeah, I know. Ric Flair. I was saying Bautista. I <laughs> yes, <laughs> the fact that the next night on Raw, like the night after he put that out there, it turned into a real thing. It was awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah, Bashamania spoofed that. They had boobs. No, they started that. Oh, did they? No, you know, yeah, Matthew uh, Matthew started that uh, before before it, it became a Bootista chant. Uh, yeah. When like they reintroduced him, and people were booing him anyway, he put up a uh, the video with Hans Moleman, and then I was saying boo, and then he spliced in Ric Flair saying Tista. But no, yeah. he did that, and then like the next night on Raw, apparently everyone who. <laughs> Had seen that started, and everyone who hadn't seen it thought it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. It was on a so on Boston Mania. I'm like, oh, this is so good. Boo, Tista, boo, Tista. <laughs> Again, the funniest part of that is they've got Hans Moleman on the screen, and he has captioned under it, actually Ric Flair, not an animation. <laughs> he does look like that at this point. And Jesus, oh, okay. the, guy aged, the guy aged like 10 years from like 2002 to 2004. Yeah, he, he age hit him hard and fast. He had a good he, run he, from like, the, well, here's the thing: from the early '70s to like the mid '90s, he didn't really age. He, no, he looked exactly the same. Then all of a sudden, bam! Father Time bitch slapped him. I think it's because he cut his hair. That's what it was. <laughs> Maybe it was the thir- it was probably the third divorce. I, I imagine three or four is when you start feeling the strain. Oh, yeah, that one was fun. That's that a Hall of Fame ceremony. Yeah, the best father and the best husband ever. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> oh, oh, that poor silly we'll see man. See how long this lasts. <laughs> God, maybe, maybe he should just pull a uh, pull a Hulk Hogan and marry someone that looks identical to your daughter. Bam. <laughs> yeah, that's not creepy. Oh God. It, the two of them side by side. It's hard to tell them apart. Oh, Lordy. Anyways, back to metal. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, track three is another one of these things I didn't know a damn thing about. But uh, the, song, the song is called Smoking Snakes, and it is about Arlindo Lucia da Silva, Ger- Geraldo Beta de Cruz. And Gerardo, Geraldo Rodriguez de Souza, who are three Brazilian Expeditionary Force soldiers who became separated from their unit and fought a large con- contingency of Germans in Italy in, on April 14th of uh, 1945. And refusing to surrender, they fought to their deaths and were buried by the Germans who placed a cross over their graves with the inscription, Dre, I don't know, it just says three Brazilian heroes. I can't read German. And it, they said it in German, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was in German. Uh, it, but it's a, yeah, it's another one of those here. another one of those crazy stories that comes out. You know, you for all the horrors of war, and there's more than a few of them, folks. There were, you know, you get moments like this where even though you know, you, even though you're enemies, even though you're trying to kill each other, there's a degree of respect for what someone's able to accomplish. I mean, yeah. Uh, it's one of those things, like, uh, the way I kind of look at a lot of these things, a lot of the soldiers, they're just guys. Like, you know. Yeah. They're, they're just guys. Like, the, the the beef is between their bosses. At the end of the yeah. day, they're just like, shit, you know, they just asked me to do this. And I'm kind of being made to do this. Sorry, guys. But, you know, usually there's not a real hatred on the other side. And I, like, I'm sure there's plenty of hatred for uh, <laughs> for the Germans from the side of people from the Americans. But, you know, I'm not quite sure, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure if that hatred uh, went all the way around. You know, to a lot of the guys on the front line, I imagine it didn't. 
I can't imagine how bad World, well, World War One. We don't know how that one was. <laughs> They're like, yeah, we're about to end the war. All right, guys. all right, guys, let's have a party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. All right, anyway, smoking snakes. Yeah, it's the best ending to a to a. Uh, I don't want to say a useless war, but a uh, not a, a war where not much happened in terms of movement. Now, like the Brit Blitz Street. Oh no, uh, there was a lot of stationary stuff. <laughs> yes, I'm, it was pretty bad. But anyways, smoking snakes. <laughs> Yeah, I had to cut it off right there, mostly because since I'm using a cell phone, most of these audio clips come across as... <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it makes it a little unfortunate for some songs, especially a lot of those that uh, are kind of high in bass. Yeah. Because a lot of the bass gets warbled. Now, a lot of the more tenor stuff, that's that's cool, like the singing. Oh, yeah, I can hear that fine. But a lot of the other stuff, I'm like, no. Yeah, Smoking Snakes. What do you think about Smoking Snakes? Yeah, I like this one because uh, it started off with a great punch. You know, you mentioned that about the the first song, uh, Night Witches. This is one that again, it starts right out of the gate and is more than willing to kind of smack you in the head. Uh, again, the story here is really, really cool. And this one accurately, I feel, conveys the sentiment a couple of those chorus refrains where they talk about, you know, these are guys from Brazil. I mean, they're pretty far removed from everything associated with World War II. I mean, you know, we, you know, Americans got involved after the Japanese decided they were going to come after, you know, I mean, there were, you know, geopolitics. We were we were bound to get involved anyway. <laughs> I mean, just given I'm our presence sure. in... Given our given our military presence in the Philippines and Hawaii, you know, places along you know in the Pacific Ocean, we were bound to get involved once Japan uh, started what they were doing. But you know, there are certain places in the world where I have to imagine you could have just gone, "Nah, we, you know what? We're way over here." <laughs> and I have, I think Brazil would be one of those places where it's just like, yeah, you know, bad stuff's happening, but. You know, I, I don't want to go that far to be involved in this. So I, I feel they did yeah. a good job of you know, musically conveying kind of the, you know, the sense of I'm way out here fighting because I think it's right. Yeah. Yeah, like this, uh, a lot of their songs, like they, they tell really interesting stories like these, like, hell, I wish I could go through their whole discography and figure out, like, you know, what every song is about. Except for Careless Rex, I know what that that album's about. <laughs> but 
is, but kind of obvious. But yeah, it's that's a good way of putting it. Because a lot of like so most of these songs, I just really kind of focused on the music of them and what did I think of them musically. And this song was actually one of the I think one of the best songs on the album. It's really just really well done, really high energy. Just overall, overall a really good song. With like I said, I, the more I find out about these, uh, you know, the lyrical content, the more I like it. Because most of these songs, I kind of more just focused on what I'm. Kind of the combination of the two, though, with our uh, the ballad we get, yeah, I, I definitely got what that song was about. So when I saw the ballad, I don't like the boom. ballad. <laughs> yes, so they do a damn good ballad. I will say that. Just kind of spoiler, damn good ballad. Which is funny because when yeah. I start, first heard it, I was just like, oh god. <laughs> but um, it ended up being a uh, you know a lot better than I thought. Oh, like yeah. I had a. I mean, we're going to get to it, but it's an anomaly as far as, you know, pacing and style goes, but it just works. I mean, it's one of those crazy things where you mesh a couple of things, and you're not, you know, on paper, you're not sure they're going to come out okay, and miraculously they do. Yeah, I guess when we get to it, we'll get more into, you know, where they placed the placed it and does it work. <laughs> but anyways. Yeah. Anyways, all right, so the next song is Inmate 4859, which is about Wilko Telecki, soldier of Polish Armia Krajowa, I think, Polish, the leader of resistance, of the resistance resistance movement in the Birkenau, Aus- or the Birkenau Auschwitz concentration camp, where he was interred voluntarily with inmate number 4859. And it produced okay, the I'll, told report. Uh, let me give you a little bit of backstory so that um, this guy was involved a little bit in World War One, especially. I mean, World War One was bad for Poland because at the time Poland didn't exist. <laughs> I, I believe. No, this is not a joke. There have been several times in the his, in European history where what we now understand to be the nation of Poland was divided up between other surrounding nations and was not its own entity. That's, I mean, it's crazy, but that's what happened. And that uh, happened, I believe, after the uh, – I forget which war uh, – which war it was. But prior to World War I, Poland had been uh, divided up between Germany, Russia, and I, I believe part of the Prussian Empire – I could be wrong about that, but there were three different countries that had, uh, through this war, had conquered the entirety of what, again, we now know as Poland, and had just, it ceased to exist. Following World War I, some of the land was, the land was taken back from Germany, we got Poland back, uh, and it remained an entity in and of itself to this day. Uh, I mean, it was part of the Soviet Union for a while, but it was still its own nation, essentially. But he fought in World War I a little bit. He was involved in World War II with the resistance because Poland was occupied by Germany uh, rather quickly. And after he was captured, he, he kind of knew what was going on with the Nazi concentration camps. And he specifically, after he was captured, said, no, I want, you know, okay, send me here. And he pointed out and he said, send me to Auschwitz, which for those of you who don't know, it had the highest death toll. It was one of the, I believe it was the largest of these, I mean, it was industrialized murder. That's all these things were. And he wanted to go to this one, and he wound up publishing his report uh, on what happened. He was the first guy, I believe, to kind of put out there in the world what exactly was going on in these places. I mean, the type of balls it takes to know what's going on at somewhere like Auschwitz and say, no, I want you to put me there so that I can tell the story. I mean, it's insane. It, it it is absolutely insane. But anyway, there's your backstory. Yeah, I was just reading about it uh, myself. I was I was just kind of amazed. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> this guy's like, yeah, I'll go. I'm good. I'll go in. That is, that's nuts. Because, yeah, I didn't, because I actually had thought they knew, like, you know, everybody knew it was a death camp. No, apparently they just thought it was a big prison or a, you no, know, I mean, like, camp. That, that's the crazy thing. I mean, until they were actually liberated and until the, we got towards the Nuremberg trials, nobody 
really knew what was going on. I mean, upper-level governments had ideas. There were rumblings about what was going on, but nobody knew for sure. Nobody knew a lot of the details. I mean, even the people who worked around them, not in them necessarily, because once you were in, you knew what was up, but you know, the towns around them, they thought they were just internment camps for you know undesirables, POWs, all that kind of stuff. They didn't know... It was not common knowledge that every day we're killing thousands of people. And, you know, Apparently this guy was, was uh, one of the first to put it out there. It's, it was 30,000 a day, according to... I don't, I'm reading I don't remember. Huge, huge number. It was crazy. Yeah, it was nuts. That's like, you know, it was 30,000 people in a day. Ugh. Yeah. And oh, yes. that's not cool. But yeah, see, like, I didn't know that. I thought everybody was like, oh, we got to stop the death camp. No, I mean, hell, there's still people that think the Holocaust is a lie, that they're idiots. But, yeah, I mean, there's You know, still... at that point, you're dealing with willful ignorance, and you just have to let it go. <laughs> see, it's like I found out one of my coworkers was arguing with me about how he never landed on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? These people do exist. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's, I don't know. I guess it's just one of those things. That's yeah, all, again, that's one of those things where no matter how much evidence you present to them that, yes, we did, they're still going to say no. I mean, if that's what they want to believe, that's what they want to believe. Yeah, well, no point. I, I stopped arguing with them after a while. So I'm like, yeah. oh, whatever. You are welcome to <laughs> believe whatever you want to. You will just sound like an idiot. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Huh. All right, 4859. Right. Yeah, so with that being said, here is uh, inmate 4859. Mm-hmm. Oh, there you go. Play button. gives me the chills now that I know what it's about. <laughs> I'm right there with yeah. you, which should tell you it's working. I mean, he's yeah. one that can give you yeah. goosebumps. I think it was like that music, the, you know, kind of like that music box thing that I had going at the beginning. That's that little oh, yeah, up on there. Well, that really kind of, you know, that slow build that they do with, uh, I'll call them the bells. I couldn't tell you exactly what it is, but yeah, that little melody they have going at the beginning, that just really kind of slow, haunting intro that they give you. It's, I mean, it's reminiscent of, you know, Tubular Bells, which is famous for being kind of the theme song to The Exorcist, or, I mean, again, obviously much slower, but uh, Halloween's theme song has kind of the same thing going on. And it's very much designed to kind of tickle something at the back of your spine and really let you know that something's up here. 
and you, you know you go from there you build into the rest of the band coming in and and it's it's perfectly i like the slower pace for this one because it's such a you know, what it deals with is so serious and so you know dep- i don't want to say de- you know it is depressing but it's so traumatic and so heavy but the slower paced song really fits the mood for it yeah yeah definitely especially you know with this much darker subject matter yeah that like just listening to this again you know right now it's like man this is really chilling especially when you, when you, you know listen to what they're talking about you know damn hero going to this camp he knows it well yeah the, i think the doomier vibe definitely fits the song really well and it does and i i love a you know slow music that's one thing myself and uh <laughs> mr mark redlitz definitely uh differ on like i don't like doom metal no, I, I'm, like, well, I'm actually like with you i love now, I have this feeling that if you took any given song and you slowed it down just a little bit, it tends to be better. I really, uh, you know, well, again, generally, it, it's a broad generalization, but, you know, a little bit, of, and I forget where I picked up on this, you know, that personal taste of mine, but I dealt, uh, I, you know, I guess there was just a time when I was hearing a lot of stuff that was put together really fast. And again, I don't mind fast stuff most of the time, but oh God, every now and then, you know, just slow it down a bit. Stop warbling if you're singing. We don't need you. Don't need to take three minutes to find a note. Find it, hold it. Be you know, slow it down. Be a little simpler with it, and everything flows so much better. Yeah. Well, I mean, some stuff like you know, thrash metal. I wouldn't oh, yeah. have it any other way. <laughs> if oh, I no, slowed that no. down, it just ruined the fun. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's a yeah, generalization, but, and it doesn't deal as much with metal as more popular music. So, yeah. But, I, yeah, but so when I hear something slower, you know, a lot of guys, you know, a lot of people, eh, you know, needs to be fast. You know, no, let it be slower. Let it sink into you just a little bit. Yeah, give it a little time to breathe. Like sometimes I'm like, okay, this doesn't need to be so slow. To hurry it up. But you know, a lot of times yeah. if, if it's a uh, Good musician, if they're you know accomplished, if they know what they're doing, they they can definitely with more time give you a better song, you know, better output. But yeah, that's yeah. So how about what, you? Did you, you like this one? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I did. Uh, like I said, I found it very, very chilling. After like I said, just reading reading about this while we were you know talking, yeah, wow. Like, this song definitely has a different meaning. I think all these songs have really a different meaning once you know what they're about, which, you know, that's how a lot of songs are. But, you know, a lot of times in music, it's not, I don't want to say it's about nothing, but it's about nothing in really in particular. Like, you know, it's very generalized, or it tells, like, a very general story. This is, like, you know, it was real. It happened, which you don't yeah. often see that in music. You know, it's not not oftentimes in a lot of popular music about something in particular, use it some allegory for something or you know, something vague. But no this was a this was actually this was a really good song. This is one like I listened to it over and over again. It's really, really well done. I enjoyed it. Which uh you know it's kinda of funny because I was really worried about this album at first. That we were gonna get a kind of a uh, an album that wouldn't be as good because, you know, we lost all of our guitars and stuff. But really they as as long as they can keep a good hook, usually the band's doing pretty well, which is yeah great. Yeah, but uh, that brings us to uh, track five to Helen Back, which is about Audie Murphy, who is one of the most decorated American veterans of World War Two. Jesus, this guy's like the Michael Jordan of World War Two. <laughs> That's not a terribly inaccurate statement. I mean, most major. Uh, engagements or conflicts he was involved in. He did a bunch of... I mean, the guy's a hero. You, when you talk about war heroes, if you know what you're talking about, this is a guy whose picture would be in the dictionary next to the definition. I mean, he did everything. Yeah. like he uh, Apparently the thing that won him the Medal of Honor at 19, nonetheless, was single-handedly holding off an entire company of Germans for an hour 
at the Colmar Pocket in France in January of 1945, and then leading a successful counterattack while wounded and out of ammunition. The balls. <laughs> yeah, the this balls. guy. Oh, God. I'm trying to remember if he's the one I... Uh, for any of you who haven't seen it, uh, there's a... Uh, this is a really brief tangent, but there's a list that was put up on, I think, Cracked, and it was real life war heroes and why they're so, you know, their closest comparison and whatnot. But some of the things, and I believe he was on there, I think this is the guy, don't hold me to this. I mean, you can don't hold me, but I believe this might be the guy who they wanted to make his life story into a movie, and no studio would do it because they felt it would be too unbelievable. Oh, yeah, I could see that. Like, apparently the guy was an accomplished actor and songwriter, and the guy fucking did everything. Like, he had the Medal of Honor, the Disturbish Distinguished Service Cross, I think two Silver Stars, Legion of Merit, two Bronze Stars. This is one V. I don't know what the V is. Three Purple Hearts, a good conduct. Good Conduct, two Presidential Unit Citations, an American Campaign, let's see, yeah, European Africa Middle Eastern Campaign, with a, apparently an Arrowhead device on that, a uh, World War II Victory, I didn't know they got something for Victory, good job, <laughs> that's like that's like the Participation Medal, isn't it, like, yeah, you were here, guys, here you go. <laughs> uh, an, army, like, yeah. an Army of Occupation with German class. A French Legion of Honor, three Fr- French Croix de Guerre, Croix de Guerre, I don't know. A Belgian Croix it's de Guerre. It's a French Con- citation. Yeah, he got, he got w- every major player in the war. I think wound up giving him some kind of a, some kind of medal. Yeah, an outstanding civilian service medal, the Texas Legislative Medal of Honor, Marksman Badge, Conven- Combat Infantryman Badge, Expert Badge. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be here all day if we just list his accolades. The, the he, his accolades have their own Wikipedia page. <laughs> There's a oh. page for uh, awards won by Audie Murphy. I'm like, holy hell! And he he died <laughs> at 45. Uh, yeah. In a, in a in like a plane plane crash. Try this bastard. Plane crash. It's always sad, isn't it? What do you bet he faked his own death and he's still out there somewhere just too damn tough to die? <laughs> <laughs> just a thought. Yes. Yes. The one who will take down the Joseph Coney. <laughs> Joseph uh, Coney. Go ahead and hit the song. Let's, let's, let's go into it. <laughs> We have to stop him. Guys, Joseph Coney's been dead for like 20 years. What the fuck? Anyways, here we go. To Hell and Back, which is actually the name of his autobiography, too. Yeah. There you go. Actually, was that a uh, movie? Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, Might have been as well. Movie. Anyway. Yeah, it was. Anyways, here we go. To Hell and Back.
there was uh, To Hell and Back. That was, I think that's this was one of the first songs that really just kind of surprised me. Because, you know, the first four songs, I was like, okay, it's Sabaton. But this one here almost had a, with that whistle they had, it was almost a very uh, Western-sounding whistle. It, all, it, had to, it turned into almost like a folk metal kind of feel to it. Oddly enough, using a uh, kind of that, that whistle you'll hear in a western, it turned more into almost partially a folk metal song with it, with that just the beat of it. I enjoyed it though. Like really, it's a really good song. Told a really good story about one of like biggest badasses in the history of all badasses. Yeah, yeah uh, what a badass. I'm with you as far as that. I like the little. This is one that uh, the first time I heard it, it took me a minute to kind of get into the rhythm. I listened to it again. And the second time through, I appreciated it more because I, you know, it, I think it was more about understanding what was coming. But, you know, again, the little, you know, again, the the whistle in there. And if you're like me, and you know, Sergio Leone and John Wayne films were a staple of you growing up. You recognize that tune. You know, you recognize that tune, the sounds. You know, it strikes a chord with you. And you know, it was a very deliberate choice by them. I feel, given that again, he's from Texas, and like you said, kind of a ball, kind of a folk song type of feel to it. I I got a kick out of it. It's one of those that I think gets better uh, every time you listen to it type of deals. You know, some hit you yeah. right out of the gate and you love them. This one grows on you. Yeah. It's like a fungus. <laughs> Apparently also uh, in his acting career he did mostly westerns. There you go. Because apparently he was a very uh, not a decorated but an accomplished actor. Like he got roles. So apparently he also uh, suffered from a severe cases of PTSD. Well, one would assume. Right. If he goes yeah, through that much stuff, he, there's going to be backlash. Yeah, it said he slept with a uh, loaded pistol under his pillow. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> well, if you That's hadn't that, done that, I don't think you've lived. Well, consider me a dead man, because I don't even own a pistol. Hell, in my house, I get told... <laughs> I get told, like, when I bought a machete, my mom's like, I'm afraid you'll cut your arm off. I'm like, Jesus. This thing's better than dishwater. I'll be fine. Well, it's hard to cut your own arm off with a machete. I mean, don't get me wrong, a machete will take an arm off, but you know, doing it to yourself is... It takes some we- some real effort. You that can really do a hand it. pretty easily, but... Like, you have to be trying to cut your own arm off with a machete. You do. And I've really played do. plenty of machetes. Yeah, because it's just so large. Like you'd have to be trying to be an idiot. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, continue with the podcast since we are almost done with the original 90 minute start, uh, run time. Because as I've come to find with this podcast, like for the first, like we run through the. Uh, First, the original runtime really slowly, and then like the last half of the album, we just blaze through it. <laughs> but I mean, Sean did. We're like, oh, I'm like, damn, Sean. Yeah. We're almost we are at two and a half hours, and we got like the last four songs done in 15 minutes. <laughs> like that, like that right. time we did that super that Superman podcast. <laughs> Superman three and four, we can get them done in an hour. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, that podcast. Uh, that was most fun. Anyways, that's that's the one they always bring up when they're like, "Yeah, too many cooks in the kitchen." <laughs> Anyways, so uh, this next track is uh titled titled "The Ballad of Bull." When I heard "Bull," I was like, "Sitting Bull?" No, oh, not this one. <laughs> it was about oh, this no, is uh, sorry, no. this is the story of a Australian infantryman. Uh, whose nickname was yeah. Bull, uh, Leslie Allen, full name. He saved 12 American soldiers uh, when we were fighting in Papua New Guinea, which and this is one of those things most people don't understand how kind of gnarly the war in the Pacific was, uh, you know, with the island hopping and whatnot. And the Japanese had gotten all the way down into New Guinea. I mean, they uh, beat Douglas MacArthur out of the Philippines. They were moving towards Australia. They were trying to shore up their oil reserves because Japan has no natural oil. And yeah. we had to fight from New Guinea all the way up to Japan, jumping from island to island. it was, a, And it was pretty bad from time to time. And this guy, you know, I, I have to imagine that if I saved one man I didn't know who was wounded, 
and bleeding out under combat circumstances, I, I'd probably be done after that. No, no, this guy, 12. Uh, under fire, he dragged 12 Americans, not even fellow countrymen, not from his unit, and he drugged them out of, again, the line of fire, saved their lives, literally. I mean, not a joke, not a maybe, you know, no, no, he actually saved their lives. Yeah, yeah, which is impressive. Yeah, this is one of the songs where, you know, immediately you get it because it's a ballad. So really, it's just you and the, you know, kind of like the music and lyrical content, which is how ballads work. You know, usually you're supposed to hear the message of the ballad, especially yeah. if it's Harry Rose Has a Thorn. God, I hate that song <laughs> so much. So much. God, I hate Poison so much. Anyways, here we go. The Ballad of Bull. A few politicians have a ballot of bull. <laughs> sometimes war is killing, sometimes it's saving lives. It's the judgment of fate, it's nothing that man can dictate. In arms when out and full of thrills. Then back again, Bull just carried on. On the fire, he carried them out one by one. Sometimes war is killing and sometimes it's saving lives. But that's a good point. Because, you know, you don't really think of it like that once, do you? I don't. Generally not. Yeah. It's a, a, a kind of a lost truth. Yeah, yeah. And it was, like I said, it was a little cheesy at first. But, you know, as the song kept going, I'm like, oh, shit, this guy's like a legit hero. Because at first I thought this was going to be just some cheesy-ass ballad about how, like, you know, war is also about saving people. But no, it's also about, you know, saving your brothers in arms from the enemy, right? So that's technically still saving lives. Damn. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what do you, what do you uh, think of this song, this, the ballad, the outlier? Uh Musically, it takes me about, you know, uh, it takes me that first little bit to kind of get into it because it's so different from what came before it and what comes after it and everything. I like the placement because it's smack dab in the middle kind of as a reminder that, you know, the, you know wars are fought by people and people are both good and bad. And, you know, once you, once you get into the feel of it, then I really start. I really enjoy it. I enjoy uh, the story. I enjoy kind of the message they're trying to tell, and uh, musically even I like it. You know, I like the uh, piano or the keyboard being featured a bit more prominently. I like the flow. You know, it just it takes a second or two to really get into the rhythm of it. I don't necessarily mean the the actual musical rhythm. I mean the whole kind of emotional feel of it. But once you're there, once they've got you in, I enjoy it. I really do. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't think this is one I could listen to, you know, on repeat. But I, I, you know, I would never, you know, skip over it. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, this is kind of like an odd song because I, as I said, when we got to it, I talked about the, you know, what I kind of feel with more outliers where they should be placed. I think it was placed in the right spot because oftentimes, if you put it towards the beginning, it kind of 
throws off the initial momentum of an album. Like, if they had this at track three, I'd be like, uh, okay. It's a bit odd. And if they had it at the end, I feel like it'd be kind of be on, ending on an odd note. Because, you know, oftentimes, yeah. like they say, with you know, when you're studying for an exam or something, you remember the beginning and the end. So mm-hmm. usually putting something like this, I feel like it makes the, the middle a little more uh, memorable. You know, give, give you kind of something to go back like, oh, yeah, that ballad, you know, the one that was like nothing, none of the other songs. And it really wasn't. And it was, like I said, it just had a really nice message of, uh, you know, war's not all bad, which is cool because, you know, most of the time it's just all about war as hell. Or I like yeah. war. Or we need to start a war. We're tanks. <laughs> We're already at war. We don't need more. Yeah, war is the answer. Is. On occasion, it is. It is. I'm trying to think what band, what which Alpha band had that album. I'll have to look it up in a second. I'm gonna say it's uh, it's one of those new bands, one of the new thrash bands. But anyways, yeah, this place it's a really good song. It's one of those. Uh, it's a bit odd, but if I were to listen to this album, you know, about every few, every few months, I, I'd listen to it. But I wouldn't put this one on repeat. This one isn't like. Uh, you know, some of their other stuff like uh, Ghost of Vision or Careless Rex or even Night Witches, I would not put this one on repeat just because it's, even though it is a, you know, kind of a nice a nice song, a beautiful song in some aspects, it's not necessarily a happy song. It's kind of, yeah. it's just one of those like, oh, that's a good point. I agree. Yeah. But yeah, now on to the uh, next Next song, track seven, which is called Resist and Bite. It is about Chasseurs Ardenais. Ardenais. Hey, uh, he's an infantry man. It's an infantry, man, infantry formation of the Belgian armed forces that fought in the Battle of Belgium in World War II. God. Can this, I is a really, this is a really funny story in that no one knows about it partially because it involves Belgium. Now, for those of you who don't know, Belgium is almost a micronation uh, between France and uh, Germany or France and Holland. It, it, again, small nation. I only I'm familiar with it because uh, actually one of my uncles served. I don't know anybody out there listening who's LDS, but uh, my uncle served a mission in Belgium, so I'm a little more familiar with it. And there were like four, this is the crazy thing. You know, Belgium. I mean, it was just kind of a stopover for the German army as they moved in and took over France. But these guys, I mean, less than 100, I think there were like 40 in the particular uh, instance they're referring to, held off a huge contingent of, uh, again, the German army. They, And, I mean, you know, Belgium, small country, no one really expected a whole lot of them will steamroll them. They fought a lot harder than the French did, all things considered. I mean... It's a really fun story. I mean, there's a lot of those as far as these things go. So, uh, yeah, just you know, you know, like 40 guys who just sucked it up and try and uh, fought a vastly superior numbers and tried to hold off, you know, the might of the German army, which was at the time considered the greatest army in the world. Well, yeah, I'm pretty sure it would have totally uh, remained as such. They wouldn't have, you know. Went to Russia in the winter. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, there were a couple of other issues with that, but no, yeah, that's one that's of those things. One always... yeah, I, I don't know your religious predilections, but Jesus if you believe cool. in divine intervention, there's a couple <laughs> of things as far as Hitler's invasion of Russia. When you realize how close he was to succeeding, and you look at just a couple of small things. Um, when the army was moving, it moved, I believe, through North Africa, at least part of it, to invade Russia. They were held up in one spot for a matter of, I mean, it's a matter of three or four days here, three or four days there. And they wound up arriving in Russia, I believe, a month, give or take, behind schedule. And those three weeks, give or take, he would have won. He would have been able to get into Moscow and Stalingrad and the Soviet Union, you know, Russia at the time would not have become what it was. He would have been able to, to I mean, again, crazy little things. So my brief aside. <laughs> That's right. Jesus was not a fan of Hitler. 
<laughs> nor should he be. Well, I think many he people. was Jewish. <laughs> that's a, that's something that pe- I don't know why people forget. But yeah, Jesus was Jewish. So uh, was no, he wouldn't be a fan of Hitler. No, yeah, he kind of took some personal offense. He's like, man, let my people go. Uh, God. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. But anyways, uh, with no further ado, the story of guys who sucked, who sucked it up and kicked some ass. Here is Resist and Bite. Swiftly, the board is closing in. Where are company of soldiers? Their body rifle strong. All alone. Stand alone. And then the ground is burning. And the jungle is at hand. That the blitz is pushing harder. The war is all around. All around. Hold your ground. Yeah, that was definitely interesting. And uh, if anybody's listening live, God bless you, by the way. Uh, we've got about two minutes left on the stream. Just want to thank anybody who's listening for listening, and anybody who will be listening, you know this. Anyways, uh, you know, come back in about twenty, thirty minutes. I don't think we'll take much longer than that to, uh, you know, uh, listen to the rest of this. And here are thoughts and some really great stuff. Here's some plugs, you know, you know everything you care about. But uh, yeah, resist them, Mike. What do you what do you think of this song, Robert? Yeah, there's a crazy thing about this that I really kind of dig. Um, first of all, the intro, uh, the way the guitar comes in. I really, you know, maybe it's because I've heard a few too many bagpipe songs, or you know, uh, my love of ACDC <laughs> yeah. and some of their intros, but. It kind of get it, you know, it gets my attention. It slowly ramps up. You know, there's actually a great line in uh, again uh, towards the end. I don't think we heard it there, but how they mentioned that you know once we've been beaten, which is inevitable by the way, and they all they're all aware of this. Once we're beaten and we're interrogated, we'll tell them proudly, no, there were just forty of us. I mean, which <laughs> yeah, which is kind of crazy. Again, it's absolutely crazy, but you know, I I do I really dig this. I love the uh, again, the pacing for especially the chorus is ju- and uh, again the, the effect that it kind of gives of impending doom. But you know, no matter what, we're still going to gut it out and fight. I mean, I, I can't say enough how good a lot of these songs are at capturing the emotion that they want you to feel. So uh, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, again, and that might just be kind of again some of my love of you know their intro and whatnot and how it's able to immediately. Speak to something that I enjoy, but I, you know, again, I enjoyed it. I still, do, you know, I, I really do. So, how about you? What, what did you enjoy this one? Yeah, actually, the intro kind of reminded me a little bit of a, uh, the, uh, a little bit of Thunderstruck there. Yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, yeah well, especially similar. after, the, yeah, especially after my, uh, you know, after being on the cheap seats where their intro was like that, uh, that cello version of it. Mm-hmm. Like and some sometimes I'm just like oh yeah okay it just kind of reminded me of that and, and your uh, mentioning of bagpipes was a uh, well it was a it was a good mention because it did kind of remind me of you know, the occasional bagpipe song that I've heard but yeah the the theme of it of kind of just like that impending doom but damn it there's forty of us we're we fucking like worked our asses off like yeah that's kind of I like the way that uh yeah that was put. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, real, it's a really good song. Like I said, another great, solid song. Another great story off of an album full of them. 
This is the seventh yeah. shipment will be pretty good. And next we get to, uh, you know, actually a a song that, uh, as I'm reading right here, damn, I didn't know this guy died. Huh. Shit. Uh, this song is called uh, Soldier of the Ar- Three Armies, which is about uh, Laurie Twenty, who is a, was a soldier in the, of the Finnish Army and then the uh, German Waffen-SS. Or, and then the uh, he was a Green Beret in Vietnam. Uh, yeah, I didn't know the guy. Kind of makes me sad now because as I was reading, I'm like, oh, he died in Nam. Well, shit. Yeah, damn it, Boo. Sorry, my cat keeps pressing. <laughs> well, he keeps pressing the backspace button. So he I keep uh, going back. Yeah, he's trying to sleep. Old fart. Yeah, it's uh, I didn't. I didn't know this. He's actually yet. a really fun story and part of a. I don't know. This is one of those things that a lot of people don't know uh, that I'm aware of, and th- that I, God, that sounded condescending. I don't mean it in the sense that I'm smarter than everyone. This is one of those maybe obscure things that I know that is not common knowledge, and there's plenty of those things that go both ways. So I'm not again. I'm not trying to sound superior, but actually during Vietnam, uh, some of the early days, uh, the United States government, uh, courtesy of you know, some of the stuff, there was a lot of somewhat shady stuff that happened at the end of World War II. I mean, I, I believe Operation Paperclip is at least somewhat in the cultural lexicon, which was the United States offering uh, amnesties and, and pardons and whatnot for Nazi scientists for them coming over. So we, you know, they wouldn't be prosecuted. They would help us with uh, you know, various scientific discoveries and all that fun stuff. Well, uh, when Vietnam really got going. Uh, the United States actually had a fair number of former SS uh, troops, uh, commanders, who were living in the States or we had access to, and we sent them over there. And when you get in, if you're really kind of big on the Vietnam War and some of the history, we had a lot of success based on what these guys did. And I believe he was one of them. And uh, the famous story, well, not so famous, but the one I know most, is uh, these soldiers – their convoys were being bombed as they were traveling between villages. So they started taking the village elders from one town, and they would strap him to the front of their truck as they drove to the next one, and they stopped being bombed. You know, the, they were the, the German kind of mentality of you know, understanding your enemy to overcome them played a big role, and, there was a, and this unit in particular had a lot of success – and then uh, the Russians found out, and you know, again, they were involved in Vietnam. And this is not, you know, something that's big, some big revelation. But they were being, you know, the uh, the Viet Cong were having a hard time with, in particular, this unit. The Soviet Union found out about it, and instead of trying to fight them, they released to the world press, "Hey, the United States is using SS soldiers," and the <laughs> international pressure wound up kind of being the downfall of that. But no, this guy, another, I mean, again, member of the Finnish Army. Actually, I believe the Finns were allied with the Axis power, powers during World War II. They hated communism. And, again, the ge- the geography of Finland meant they were constantly under pressure from uh, the Soviet Union, Russia, uh, before it became the Soviet Union. So that's more where that came from. He was opposed to Stalin more than supporting Hitler. But, no, it's uh, again, f- another fun story. So, again, I'm talking way too much, so I apologize. <laughs> No, I mean, isn't that what the, uh, isn't that kind of sort of what the the co-host does? I'm the color commentator here. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, dude, it's totally cool. Like, I didn't know, I don't know a lot of these things. I mean, geez, you know, I was the only one to teach history class. <laughs> yeah, that's well, really, as we mentioned uh, before, if any history teacher out there, find some Sabaton songs that deal specifically with what you're trying to teach. You might get some more... You get some interest. Yeah, yeah, that uh, I, I'd actually turned on one of my old high school history teachers on to them. I'd ran into him at a gas station last year, and I uh, gave him my the album I had that had Civil War, and then like five uh, Sabaton songs at the end. I gave that to him. He's like, "Oh, thanks," because he's like the guy that pretty much got me in the metal. So there we go. Figured I'd uh, show the love. Yeah, yeah, because I because then uh, when we talked about uh, I forget what. I'm, I think it was the stuff with the uh, 
Native Americans. The uh, he played uh, Run to the Hills. It's great. I've been looking forward to that all semester. <laughs> it was like awesome. Finally, a song I know. <laughs> yeah, it sucks that he died. This guy in Vietnam. Yeah, helicopter crash. Great. Huh. Anyways, go ahead and play the song, and I guess we'll talk a little more about it. Yeah, so here is Soldier of Three Armies. song the way I wanted to. <laughs> Darn you blog talk radio deficiencies. Uh, oh, that was funny. The uh, one time when Mark's compute Skype just would not work, he uh, he called in and he's like, as he's listening, he's like, is this how it is every week for you? I'm like, yeah. It's like, oh, that's awful. I'm like, eh, I get used to it. <laughs> But yeah, what, what do you think of Soldier of Three Armies? I liked it. I mean, this is another. This is one that uh, starts off with a heck of a punch. You know, uh, the previous two, especially, have had a bit slower intros. I mean, so to get one that just jumps right in with you know, some of the harsher sounds, and then uh, you know, going. I really, I just enjoy the song. I mean, I like the flow, uh, which is kind of a theme of these. Um, I like kind of the harshness that they imbue, again, right at the start, and some of the, I think the chorus has kind of the same feel, or at least the start of each individual versus the chorus, I'm a little different, but I I love the feel that it gives you, uh, you know, the way that they kind of go over a bit of what he was able to accomplish, I mean, I I just enjoy this song. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I am on it. Like, this song, like, the subject matter is really interesting. I don't know if they quite used as much as they could with it, but I mean, it's still like a really good, it's still a really good song, and like, yeah, the feel of it was great. Like, overall, I just really, really enjoyed the song. Like, I, this is, I guess this kind of is, uh, you know, this point at the, uh, you know, in the album where you're kind of just like, okay, we're getting towards the end. So this is more like the home stretch part of it, but you know, it was still pretty uh, solid, pretty solid song. I liked it. I think it's one of those I could probably listen to on repeat if I had to. I enjoyed it, so. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I am on it. Like, you know, it's enjoyable. I like it. I can dig it. Anyways, uh, on to the next track here. Let me plot back down here. Which one is this? Oh, Far From the Fame. Far From the Fame is about the hero of Czechoslovakia, who is Air Marshal Karl Janosek, who is the creator of Czechoslovakian forces in the Royal Air Force, and was later imprisoned by the communist regime in Czechoslovakia. Hmm. Very, very Yeah, this guy, uh, if you want the story, this guy was, uh, again, he was part of the Czechoslovakian army. He was awarded the title of Air Marshal, uh, actually by the British Army. He was part of, he was, he was part of their effort uh, when they started the repush. I don't, uh, Again, specific. I don't remember if he was specifically involved with D-Day, but he was very involved. 
you know, getting the Czechoslovakian army to be a real thing. Starting the and the the issue with him is, you know, and part of the reason that you get the title far from fame is once the uh, Soviet Union had taken over Czechoslovakia, they immediately imprisoned this guy and like shipped him off to Siberia. They didn't want him and his leadership skills and his philosophies and his experience and what not to be used against them because he was a he was a patriot of his country, and there was no way he was going to sit on his hands while you know the Soviet Union as you know essentially raped <laughs> his country. So yeah. he's, he's one of those who's forgotten just because of those unfortunate circumstances, but uh, did a lot of good as far as that goes. And you know, again, you start when you basically start a division of the military in your home country, you, you're kind of a big deal. You're, you're kind of like the guy, kind of like you know, like George Washington, like you know, like he's our like the guy who really started us going. Like yeah, we kind of put him on that pedestal. I'm like the guy. Yeah, he is. Yeah, <laughs> this this guy was like you know like like Hulk Hogan or something. Like you know like he was the one guy that everybody could look up to and respect and love. Except then like Hulk Hogan, which they never got tired of him. Anyways, <laughs> with my lame jokes aside, here is uh, track number nine off of uh, Sabaton's Heroes: Far from the Fame. Eh, let me try. Well, I I'm yeah, I, mean, I press. Yeah, I press play on it. And eh. It's just loading. Abby. Eh, let me try it. See if it's. Okay. There we go. I got it. I don't know what's up with mine. Mine's still like, oh yeah, I'm just playing through the whole song, but I'm really loading. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think it's probably figured out. 
Yeah, it's probably the internet around here because it's storming really bad. But uh, yeah, far from the fame. Uh, what do you what do you think of the song? I li- it's not one that I like. Uh, I like the military feel to this one, which is I mean for a for a group that focuses almost exclusively on combat and conflict, they don't have a whole lot of music that to me at least speaks to being you know to having the military feel. You have a real kind of marching feel to most of this. And you have a lot of, uh, again, kind of chords and spacing of music that is designed to inspire. And, I mean, I, again, this is just spacement of notes and whatnot. But I, I did. I enjoyed it. I, I like it. It's, again, it's a little different from what came before and what's about to happen. So, you know, I'm down. I liked it. Yeah, yeah. I I liked it. I felt like this was one of the more, uh, I guess, one, just one of the songs that was kind of there for me. But I think it just came as a symptom of being towards the end of the album. That tends to happen, as like I said, if you if you ever listen to this podcast. Usually, once we hit about the uh, three quarters mark of an album, things start to blend together. Just because, unless yeah. like it's a real standout song, usually it's just like, yeah. well, you know, it was a thing. Well, I mean, this was still a good. This was still a good song, and I will agree with you. There's not a lot of songs that are necessarily. Uh, they talk a lot about it, but they don't necessarily sound like a, a band that would be about the. They don't. They don't have the sound of the military, obviously, because there's actual individuality. Hey yo, huh? Uh huh. Because that's how the army works. I've never been in the army, and if you've ever been in the army, anybody listening, I salute you. You are awesome. Though they did cover in the army now. That was the bonus track on uh, Careless Rex. It was really good. I liked it. Careless Rex had a lot of bonus tracks. Hell, Sabaton has awesome bonus tracks. They really do. Yeah. Because they had that and then the Twilight of the Thunder God cover, which was so cool. Because you don't really hear power metal covering death metal very often. No, there's not a lot of overlap. There's There's not really much of a crossover between the two. But uh, that brings us to the uh, last song of the, uh, you know, the regular, you know, the actual uh, normal, regular CD portion of the album. Uh, this song is called Hearts of Iron, and it is about the German forces of the 12th and 9th Army, who, facing defeat at the hands of the Soviets, created a corridor across the uh, Elbe, Elba, to protect Elba, Elba, Elba to protect fleeing refugees and soldiers to escape and surrender to the West. Oh, wow. It's pretty cool. Yeah, this is actually a really kind of interesting story in the sense that this was, I mean, defeat was imminent. Uh, the soldiers at this time, they stayed, they were trying to stage a breakout, and the, it's a military term. If you're pinned down, you want to try and break through the lines to escape. Well, you try and move around them in some kind of flanking or escape maneuver. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But uh, and there was actually also a lot of tension at the time, and historically there was a fair amount of this anyway between the uh, the Waffen SS and the Wehrmacht. Now the Wehrmacht is just uh, what we would refer to as the army. It's the I, again I could be wrong about this. this is my understanding, uh, the, but the Wehrmacht was just kind of their basic army, uh, the, sh- the shock troops, the rank and file, whereas the SS were uh, the elite. They were kind of the special forces as far as the German army was concerned and there was a lot, but there were also separate divisions they weren't under, they didn't have the same leaders they didn't have they, you had a different purview uh, the the officers in the Wehrmacht couldn't necessarily give orders to the SS and vice versa there was a lot of tension between the two because they each I mean, you get this but there were a lot of stories that had started circulating circulating at this time about the SS ignoring the Wehrmacht and just trying to help themselves and so you've got some division there, and the 12th and 9th armies of the German, you know, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll go with armies. I forget if they were regiments or divisions or how you would denote that. But uh, they were trapped in what wound up being, you know, East Berlin, East Germany, and they were surrounded by the Soviets. And they wanted to escape. They wanted to break out, and they wound up. Some they were somewhat successful. They broke through the lines, and what they did was they established a. a Again, it says here a corridor, which is just uh, – you imagine from a military standpoint, just you have a line of troops on one side and then a line on the other, and you have the space in between. 
And if they're your own troops, that's your corridor where you can move with a degree of safety. And they did this. They held both ends, and everyone had to get across the Elba River because on the other side of the Elba was where the Allies were coming in, and they were not going to surrender to the Soviets. That was, you know, because, again, you get shot, you get shipped off to Siberia, all the terrible things that Stalin wound up doing. And the belief was it's better to surrender to the Western powers than to the Soviets. So in this last-ditch effort, as Berlin is burning around them, they were able to create a corridor and get some people, uh, soldiers and civilians alike, across the Elba and into friendlier hands from a a point of surrender. So it's another really cool story. And these guys, you know, they didn't have to give credence to the civilians who were there. They didn't have to go through all this effort. You know, it's another story of, you know, being on the other side but still trying to do the right thing. Yeah, it was uh, just reading here that it was – yeah, the civilians were starting to take pity on a lot of those young soldiers. Like, you know, the guys, the uh, the Wehrmacht. I think I said that right. Yeah. Yeah. And allowed, and well, they they, allowed them to change. A lot the of them were conscripted. There was a big draft that went on as Germ- as things got worse and worse for Germany. A lot of young mm-hmm. people, a lot of people who didn't believe. They were poorly equipped. They were poorly ar- – I mean, just it was – in some cases, it was just downright sad. Yeah, I heard by the end of uh, World War II, it was mainly old men and young kids. That's really yeah. all. Yeah, that's all they really had uh, had left, unfortunately. But it said one of the uh, documented cases was a uh, an SS uh, man appeared at the door of a cellar, intending to shoot a Panzerfaust into a cellar with about 40 civilians and and young Wehrmacht soldiers in it, only to be shot dead by one of the, one of the soldiers. Uh, for yeah, those of you who don't the, know what a Panzerfaust is, it's a bazooka. It's a rocket launcher. It, it's an RPG. Yeah, there's, <laughs> well, Panzerfaust means tank death. It's kind of the rough yeah. translation. These were what they would shoot at tanks. Yeah. You know, it, was, it, it was pretty much a damn rocket launcher. It was a bazooka. And he was about to blow it into all these people. But then one of the soldiers was like, no. Not cool, bro. And killed him. Yeah. But yeah, apparently, like there were really, really high uh, death tolls. It was a big mess. But you know, it was good. I always like stories of you know the people we see as the quote unquote enemies being the uh, overall in the uh, still on the right side of morality. You know, trying to do something because at the end of the day, they're like you know, we're screwed. So they're just trying their asses off to do the right thing. Yeah, always like that. I'm with but, you. Uh, yeah, so here we go. Uh, the the finale of the main album. Here is Hearts of Iron.
Right there. Uh, this song was, I just felt like a, as a finale to the, the main CD, you know, without all the bonus tracks, I felt like it was a great finale. You know, the, this song here, I mean, it is quintessential Sabaton. Like, if, you know, if I was going to show somebody one song off this album and go, you know, this is what makes Sabaton great, I would show them this song, you know, a real a song about an epic, desperate sp- struggle for these. You know, these people to kind of just come out alive, really. It's such a really good song. You know, like a really nice story, really catchy, you know, just a really catchy song. Overall, like I said, I really liked it. What did you think about it, Robert? I couldn't think of a better way to end this particular album. Uh, not just the story, because, again, chronologically speaking, this story takes place at, again, the final battle as far as Europe was concerned, uh, the fall of Berlin. But you get this really great kind of uh, lamenting quality. And there's a couple of great lines at the end. Uh, you know, after everything's over, you know, we can't look back on this and be pr- You know, this is the one thing, maybe. You know, this final breakout that we can look back on and say, you know, we can look back on this and be proud of what we've accomplished. But you know, looking at, you know, it's not, you know, looking at the whole thing, it's not about, you know, the war. It's not about the people in power in Berlin. It's not about the idea of a German Reich. It's about the fact that we have fought and bled together for however many years, and we just kind of want it to be over. And I just. I, w- I don't. I don't think you could have picked a better song on this album to end with. It really. And again, I just. I can't help but feel that there's just this kind of undertone of you know, lamenting with sadness, kind of everything that's transpired, as far as World War II is gone is concerned. So I, I really enjoyed it. You know, I'm with you. This is probably. If again from this album, if you were picking one song to let someone know about, you know, okay, here's. Here's kind of everything that encompasses what makes the band what it is. I, I'm with you. I would have chosen this one. Yeah, I feel like it's just overall. Just that's probably for the best. And it's like just a great way to really in in the main part of the album because next we have one cover and another oh, one which is a cle- one is a, another one is a clever tribute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which I didn't get that at first. <laughs> uh, yeah, so some people are kind of with you there. I it, it took I when I first saw it, I my I, my actual initial thought was, oh, Man of War. It can't just be that, can it? And then you listen to the song and you're like, no, no, it it is so cool, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you can listen to these guys for like a minute, and you can tell they're big Man of War fans. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. So I mean, it's pretty. I think I think it's a pretty cool song. You know, I love it when bands, you know, pay, pay tribute to their own, uh, to to their forefathers, to their idols, to people they love. You know, always I always enjoy that. So uh, yeah, you know, let's go ahead and play, play the song, and then we'll just talk about it a little bit before. Uh, yeah, before we get to the, you know, what I feel like the coolest thing ever, <laughs> the Metallica cover. But anyways, here is a Man of War.
cheese. I love it. <laughs> uh, this I got is a like brother the who most... says cheese goes with everything, so this is kind of proof. Uh, yeah. Man of War is proof that cheese goes with everything. Yeah, a tribute to Man of War that sounds a lot like Man of War. It's a pretty good way. It's like cheese on cheese. You can never yeah. say wrong. You can never go wrong with cheese on cheese. Gotta love it. Yeah, uh, I, I was never a, I've never been a huge Man of War fan just because yeah they kind of just float right out of the uh, out of those bands that I'm like man I should totally pick up some of their stuff like you know when I hear Man of War I'm like oh this is nice but I never really feel the yearning to pick up anything of theirs mainly because well jeez well that's also kind of what happens when you are one of the forerunners of a genre you either are you either are so good that everything else is trying to copy you or what you accomplish is more you know, your legacy is not so much necessarily your own work, it's what you inspire others to do. And that's kinda of where Man of War falls. If you're not a huge fan, and I actually am, I I enjoy their stuff. But by and large, it, it's there were like several different bands that took influence from what they did and kind of crafted their own little uh, I don't even want to say like sub in some cases subgenres. But it's more that you know what that band was able to influence as far as so many you know in particular like symphonic power metal or power metal in general, they took a lot from what Manowar was able to do, and they just took it to their specific level i mean uh stuff like hammerfall um obviously oh, yeah. sabaton you know, you can hear the influence so uh, but as far as are they you know, again, this is one of those things. I don't necessarily think that everyone who enjoys, you know, Alestorm, Hammerfall, Sabaton would necessarily enjoy Manowar, but you can always, but you can tell what, what Manowar inspired them to kind of go to kind of accomplish. So, I don't know. I'd like to think of that as, you know, kind of like the Beatles. What they produced was not necessarily great. What they inspired others to do was, and yes, I hate uh. the Beatles. I don't hate the Beatles. I just never listen to much of them, so I don't really get the the whole like the crazy in, thing about the Beatles. Love for them. Uh, I think people who grew up with them have the undying love for them, and fair play. Well, I've actually kids, enjoyed every cover. Too. Every cover of a Beatles song I've heard, pretty much, I've enjoyed. In most cases, a great deal more than the original recording. So take that for what it's worth. Yeah, like, I'm just—I never really listen to much. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of those undying fans growing up in my generation because they want to believe that they should have been in another generation. And really, they—if they were in that generation, who's to say they wouldn't have missed on the on the Beatles in the first place? But they, oh well. Yeah, <laughs> you, you never yeah. know. I mean, yeah, I kind of I kind of call them overrated at times. I get yelled at. I mean, I'm like, it doesn't mean I hate them. It's just I don't get the big deal because they're just, I guess they're just not my thing. Yeah. I'm oh. with you. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I like Man War. It's just I never got into them, and I guess kind of what they're uh, some some of the more jokes about them kind of just make me kind of snicker. I'm like, oh, Man War, you're you so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of those album covers. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. Anyways, anyways, but yeah, I mean that was I felt like it was a it's a good song. It's a loving tribute. It's really nice. It's a fun listen, you know. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah nothing. Not, not, nothing too bad. I, I could think it. It's a lot of not, fun. Not great. That, not earth shattering, but fun. Yeah. It's like I said. It's just nice. You know, I feel like it's a nice tribute. And sometimes it doesn't have to be amazing to be a nice tribute. Sometimes that tribute can make it amazing. So there you go. But anyways, uh, on to the finale for this album. The finale for this podcast, as we're starting to, I'm sure, we'll run low on time. Yeah, we have, oh, 24 minutes. Whatever minutes. will we do? 24 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll, we'll be shorten our plugs. I'll only plug two things. Oh. <laughs> Something to that effect. Yeah, I'll probably run through my plugs quicker than the usual, like 30 minutes, because I haven't done much. But, uh, yeah, here is... Uh, something that when I was looking at the track list this morning to listen to this album, I was like, oh, oh boy. Oh, this is going to be good. It's, uh, it's 
Cavaton covering uh, Metallica's For Whom the Bell Tolls. Oh, this is going to be good. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and just play the song. We'll, we'll get talk about it after we play it, just because oh, this is so good. Here, here we go. For Whom the Bell Tolls. did you think about that? Uh, as a brief warning, if I cut out, my phone has probably died. It's beeping at me, so I'm not hanging up on your okay. right choice. So just, if I cut out, here's right. your disclaimer. I enjoyed this. I really liked the addition of kind of the orchestral symphony sounds in the uh, behind it. I was worried when I first heard this because... I'm a pretty big Metallica fan. I mean, I'm not a, you know, I wouldn't call myself an Uber fan or you, however you choose to delineate your various levels of of obsession. But this is one of my favorite Metallica songs as well. So I was you know, I was hopeful, but I was still a little leery and I loved it. I mean, they slowed it down just a little bit. You add the symphonic elements to it and you put it in the context of, you know, what the song says as an epilogue to their you know concept on heroes i I, i'm down i enjoyed this i really enjoyed this uh absolutely a great cover so i I was happy yeah uh the only thing i can say is the intro needs to be a bass (laughs) yeah i actually had yeah i was like yeah the guitar kind of throws me a little i don't like it as much the tone's not right 
So I actually had a debate with uh, my history teacher, the one I mentioned earlier. He's like, no, that's a guitar at the beginning. I'm like, dude, that's a bass. He's like, no, that's a guitar. I'm like, look at every live play, like playing ever. It's a bass. It's Cliff on the bass. It's not <laughs> my guitar. <laughs> eh, we, I don't think we ever finished that argument because I was right. <laughs> but, yeah, like, like it was – like maybe some of the, the down tuning on the uh, on it didn't work as well, but this cover is tremendous. This added symphonic elements really start to play up the kind of kind of the drama, and they this makes the song has been made Sabaton's own. I feel, you know, like yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's better. No, the original is still better. I mean, the original is great, but you know, I feel like this is Sabaton taking a like a Metallica song and making it, you know, Sabaton's own. You know, adding in those symphonic elements, slowing it down just a pinch to where it kind of fits with a lot of their discography, and it's singing about World War One. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> it's it is so good. It's such a good cover. It moves right up there on the, my favorite covers of all time. So well done. Like I'm very tempted to go send this to Mark right now because <laughs> we all Do know it. there's one thing Mr. Mark Radlitz loves. It's a good cover, and he loves Metallica. <laughs> And I think he, and I don't think I don't know if he likes Sabaton very much. I don't think I've asked him, but I'm sure he doesn't mind him. So there you go. The combination of all those things, Mark should be in love with it. Yeah, we'll send uh, it to him. We'll bombard him with it between the two of us. Yeah, it work. It work. Look, look what we found. Hey, look, Mark. Hey, look. <laughs> but anyways, yes. With that, uh, you know, with that cake, that topper on the cake that is heroes. Uh, what did you think of uh, this album overall? I liked um I liked that they had a theme to it as far as you know taking her, uh, stories of heroes be it you know a specific person or a unit or a, just a circumstance in some cases and using that as your inspiration you know the way they placed the songs I feel was good you had a great opener you had a great closer you even had a pretty good middle there I don't feel there's a really weak song in the entire bunch I mean you know we can kind of nitpick here and there but on the whole you know there's nothing here that I would not listen to again happily so I'm a fan I like the album buy it people <laughs> yeah uh, for me I'm not nearly as uh, plugged into the metal universe this year as I was the past two. So I mean, I've only listened to like maybe 15 albums this year. When at this point I was well in the 30. It's like my my at the beginning of the year I was like, okay, I listen to at least 10 albums a month. Nope. So far I'm like six months in and I'm 15. Uh, I'm behind. I need to catch up on my Spotify playlist. But yeah, this album's yeah. definitely way up there in my top because it's. Like, even the songs are like, yeah, I mean, they're still good songs. They tell great stories. They kind of keep within, they, they feel like Sabaton. They sound like Sabaton. You know, they just, they, they they teach me things. There's a great cover. There's a great tribute. There's great songs. I'm not going to say this is the best album of the year quite yet, but, I mean, it's up there. It's in the top 15 at least, which is a, which is a real feat, I think. Because, like, I, I've come to find that, like, top 10 is, like, the elite and top fifteen is like you know damn good. Like I I would buy any album in my top fifty each year just because they're that damn good. But this is one that I really like. If I can get it a little cheaper than uh, the regular price, I'm gonna pick it up. It's really good. This is one of those I can just listen to over and over and over again. So you know I really just really enjoy it. I like it. I love it. Can't wait to hear the next one. So yeah. That being said, uh, plugs 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 plugs. Uh, what you got, Mister Winfrey? All right. Uh, first and foremost, I host the 411 Ground and Pound radio show every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Myself and, uh, at the moment, Jeffrey Harris, we tackle the wide, wacky world of MMA. This week we'll be reviewing UFC 174. We also have a special guest. Um, I got hooked up via Sean Comer with a guy by the name of Brandon Jones. He runs a small promotion out of Phoenix, I believe Phoenix, out of Arizona. I'll say Arizona because I don't want to be completely inaccurate. But he has a promotion that he runs every now and then. He has a Muay Thai, I believe, striking gym. Uh, so it'll be interesting to get him. We've got an interview with him coming up this week, so looking forward to that. My own show, Everyone Loves a Bad Guy, is live every Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern here on the Radlich and Broadcasting Network. My last 
episode. I had Mark Radlich on. We talked about The Simpsons, and it was awesome. So be a, uh, this Friday, I have a loose plan at the moment of tackling villains who use time travel as their mode of attack. That's a big part of their gimmick. So I'll probably be retreading a few characters, especially since I just wrapped up my uh, a look at comic book characters and time travel is a staple for people. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, my weekly column, if you're interested in MMA, is locked in the guillotine. It goes live every Friday in the MMA Zone of 411mania.com. And this week, I am heaping praise on UFC flyweight champion Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. I'll talk about why he has the correct mentality to be a champion, why I look forward to his fights, all that fun stuff. So check that out. And uh, this Tuesday, next week, the 17th, my stint hosting the Long Road to Ruin wraps up. Myself, Sean Comer, and special... Benjamin J. Cologne will be tackling the bad entries into the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Uh, last episode, we tackled the good ones. We had plenty of good things to say. This week, we get to verbally eviscerate a bunch of crap, including Rennie Harlan. That'll be fun. So that's all I've got coming up. Uh, thanks for having me. I had fun. Oh, dude, thank you for uh, coming on. Like, as I have learned, this podcast is a bitch to try to find a uh, you know suitable co-host for. Like, I'm lucky Sean was so happy and eager to come on for the two episodes he did. And now he's actually like, dude, anytime you can get me back on, I'd love to come on. I'm like, dude, awesome. And I'm like, yeah, so thanks for coming on. I know I know I'd mentioned before, I'm like, man, if I ever need somebody, I'm gonna come and find you because I know you like metal. I mean Jesus, this this point I said, I'm gonna tell Mark we should have called it during his uh his still when he was away the power metal hammer of doom. Because <laughs> besides my mayhem podcast it was Nightwish Retrospective, and then the new Epica album, and now this. So it's one black metal retrospective, a power metal retrospective, and two power metal albums, which is funny because it took us, well, almost a whole year to review one power metal album with just me and him. So it's, it's, all, it's very funny. <laughs> well, so you guys ever do Hammerfall, Lordy, or uh, you want to do pirate metal? If you want to do Ailstorm, I'll oh, show up. Oh, if we, uh, dude, if we do Ailstorm, it'll be amazing. I'm actually not the biggest Lordy fan. I'm really not. I guess it's just one of those, like, I never, I was, I don't know, I was, when I listened to them, I'm like, okay, like, they're a thing, but they, I guess they never impressed me. Yeah. But, hey, they're fun. More of a Guar guy, maybe. Yeah, we could do Guar. <laughs> Guar. Well, they're not going to come back with anything new. <laughs> well, they probably will. I, I've heard they're looking for a replacement for, for David Brocky, so. I mean, that's well, the whole again, reason you guys they do Ailstorm, I will be happy to show up for more wenches and mead. That's right. Maybe some squash buckle, you know. <laughs> oh, it's going to be so much so much fun. But, yeah, I'll definitely keep that in mind. I don't know what's going to be on the horizon besides Steel Panther. And I think maybe that Donald, that uh, album about uh, Scrooge McDuck. It's like everybody wants to be on. Like, he was like, oh, that's yeah, Mark like, said okay. he didn't like it. He did, yeah, I heard it wasn't that great. Like, the review for it was just like, meh. Like, it's just like, okay, whatever. But, yeah, I I was, no, I remember Mark was all gung-ho about it. I was just like, yeah, whatever. I never watched DuckTales as a kid. Because I missed that boat just, like, right by, right by like, a few, like, a year or two. Mm. Missed the Disney afternoon boat. It's all about the the uh, kids WB and the Fox kids. and Yeah. Anyway. Some yeah. stuff you no, missed, I'll... some stuff you avoided. That's true. That is true. But most of it I miss because as a child I could watch violent things like DBZ and Power Rangers because I punched people as a kid. So I make up for both <laughs> watching watching both genres as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I'll totally you know, like I said. If we ever have anything on the horizon that you want, to listen, if you want to review, just let me know. I'll talk to Mark. I'm sure right. he would be more than happy to oblige. All right, will do. Ah, cool. All right, uh, as for my plugs, uh, I don't really have much. Like I said, I've been working, and all my damn good uh, hours for podcasting and writing have been taken, except for Fridays and Saturdays where I try to get out of the house. <laughs> so uh, there's pretty much, you know, the Rattleton Broadcasting Network as a whole. It's your, uh, it's your home for almost every podcast you'll ever want to listen to ever. 
there's, uh, of course, this podcast, which will be back in two weeks with the uh, mandated reporter back in the saddle. This will be his first official, like, you know, announced return to the Razzle the Broadcasting Network. So check it out. It'll be uh, me and him doing All You Can Eat by Steel Panther. Oh, that's going to be fun. God. If you want to see me and Mark at our goofiest, give us a comedy album. Oh, God. It is going to be great. And then uh, I think after that we'll be doing the new Body Count, now that I think about it. That's going to be good. His body count in the, is in the house, motherfuckers. Uh, there's also uh, from the cheap seats, which is uh, Jason Teeley, Jesse Starcher, and if I can ever get back on myself, because I get off at ten, and typically <laughs> they start at nine. So right as I get off, I try to call in. Sometimes it's like, no, nope, can't get off. But their last episode, they uh, actually had a call in from an eighth grader who uh, was doing something, I think, with his little brother in MS, and it was like it's really nice little story. I remember I read it. I didn't listen to the podcast yet, but it was like it was really nice. It was really touching, heartwarming, and shit. You know, it was nice. But uh, check them out every Thursday at nine o'clock. Maybe I can get them going at nine thirty so I can call in. But yeah, give them a listen. And then there's the uh, Sentai Rider podcast. Uh, your home for all things Tokusatsu. Uh, when my computer's back alive, maybe we can uh, get some going. Maybe if I can actually record them through Blog Talk, I can get some stuff out earlier. But I'll just have to see. I'll talk to Mark and see what's up with that. Uh, but, uh, you know, find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Sentai Rider Podcast. That is S-E-N-T-A-I-R-I-D-E-R Podcast. Greatly appreciate that. And uh, actually, right now, you can probably go to the uh, co- the Cooperative Multiplayer Podcast. I'm gonna As soon as I get done with this, I'm going to call into that because I'm late. <laughs> Where uh, it's my it's gonna be myself, Sean Garmer, Daniel Anderson, the returning Stephen Randall, and uh, special guest Randy Isabel as we talk E3. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be fun. So uh, find the uh, I think the TWNE either the uh, cooperative multiplayer uh, channel like channel on Spreaker.com or the uh, the Wrestling to the Max page. I think it might be Wrestling to the Max. But yeah, go check that out. It's gonna be really good, really fun. Love it. And uh, usually we are live Sunday nights at midnight, so check us out. Yeah, and then finally, the Hammer of Duke News Report on 41mania.com and the Music Zone will be back eventually, hopefully, knock on the wood. If I ever get motivation in time, uh, two things I'm lacking. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, that's all for plugs. Uh, I'm pretty sure that is that is it for this edition of the uh, Metal Hammer of Doom. Oh, wow, six minutes left. Damn, we're good. But all right. Uh, <laughs> thank you again, Robert, for uh, coming on, showing up. It was great. It was great having you. And like I said, if there's anything you know that's coming out, just let us, that we don't know, just let us know, and I'll, I'll talk to Mark. Maybe we can get some going. Yeah. All right. Hey, it was a blast yeah. to be on here. Thanks for having me. Uh, not a problem. And uh, for Robert Winfrey and myself, uh, I want you all to, uh, in, in the words of Mandated Reporter, and, uh, be well, be safe, and behave. And remember. Keep the metal faith alive.